In this walkthrough video, we're going to be taking a look at how you can use Nintex Workflow Cloud to automate your loan forgiveness process. In this scenario, we're specifically going to be looking at an example from the Paycheck Protection Loan Forgiveness Program as a starting point. However, even if you are working on a different process, this should give you a good starting point for how you can build out your specific workflow. In other walkthrough videos, we'll often go through and build the workflow from scratch. However, as this is a relatively robust form and workflow, I'm actually going to use a pre-configured workflow from the Nintex Process Accelerator Gallery, and we'll speak through all the different parts of the workflow and form, including details like form rules and action configuration. If you would like to download a copy of this template from the Nintex Process Accelerator Gallery, you can go to gallery.nintex.com, select Workflows, make sure that you're on Nintex Workflow Cloud, you can enter your Nintex Workflow Cloud tenant ID, and then scroll down to the Loan Forgiveness process and download the template. This will automatically add the template into your NWC environment, and you can follow along from there. Before we get into the guts of the workflow itself, it's important to understand what data we are capturing on our request form. So let's go ahead and open up our start event. And the first piece here is we'll want to make sure that our configuration is set to anyone with the form URL. This will make sure that we can host it on a public facing website. Next, we'll go ahead and select design form to open up our form designer. And here in the Nintex forms designer, you can see our pre-configured paycheck protection program form. Now this is made up of a variety of different controls and we can see how those would actually look when being viewed from the form in the preview option. Back on the Designer tab, you'll notice that we have several different sections or pages on this form. To configure these, we can select Configure Pages at the top, and this will bring open the menu that will allow us to add additional pages, modify the existing pages, or change the layout and flow of the pages for this form. Two of the most important configurations in this section will be the navigation flow and the navigation layout. Navigation flow controls if the pages need to be accessed sequentially, as in one, two, three, and then four, while a navigation flow of step non-sequentially means that users can move between the pages in any order that they choose. You can also provide additional header text for the pages. However, in this case, we'll go ahead and leave that blank. The navigation layout configuration will change whether or not the pages are seen as tabs at the top of the page or as sections that roll down the page vertically. Here within the first page, we start at the top with a couple different label controls. Label controls allow you to provide a variety of different text into your form and allow you to customize that text with rich text formatting. And as you can see within one of these label controls, you can add hyperlink text that will let you reference outside of your current form. If we were to open up this label control, and then if we wanted to have a larger editing canvas, we can actually expand this open to our rich text editor. Now, in this example, you'll notice that the URL is not actually set as a static value. Instead, we are referencing a form variable. And while we will go into form variables in more depth later in this walkthrough, quickly we will take a look at how you can add this directly in the designer. If we select the variable insert tab, we can see all of the form variables that are available to us. And here at the bottom, we have our TXT worksheet URL that we've gone and added this set URL to. This is a text variable. And you might ask, well, do you have to use a variable to reference a URL? And the answer to that is no. However, we reference this URL in several different places throughout our form design. To make things easier, we've gone ahead and added the URL to a form variable that we can then just reference instead throughout our form design. The next part of this first page is gonna be a couple different group controls. Groups are an extremely powerful control within Nintex Forms as they allow you to logically group together other controls and nest them inside of the group. In this first group, we've gone ahead and named this Business Info as it will collect a bunch of information related to the business. And then in the second group, we've actually only named this Group 6. However, we could have given it a more descriptive group name such as Loan Information as it'll be collecting 
things like the loan number, the lender number, and the loan amount. Beyond just collecting different controls together, groups are also powerful because you can apply rules directly to the group instead of needing to apply them to various different controls within. This allows us to keep the number of rules in our form down and makes manageability of the form easier in the future. In this particular case, if we look down in group 6, we can see that when we make changes to the payroll schedule control, other controls may appear or disappear. This is because we actually have a group nested inside of a group. And so instead of applying these hide rules to the individual controls, we've just applied it to that singular group. And we'll go ahead and take a look at that a little bit later. The first thing that you'll probably notice in this top group is that each one of these controls have a small black eye next to them. What that means is that each one of these controls has a tooltip that has been provided by the designer. This makes it easier to communicate information to the end user so they have a better understanding of what they need to enter into that field. You will probably also notice that there are a couple controls that look like they already have a value populated in them. If we take a look at this primary contact name control, we can see that it's a text short control. And if you've not designed with Nintex forms before, you can actually go take a control from this toolbar and then drag it on anywhere in your design canvas and let it go. And the controls will automatically resize themselves. But taking a look back at this first last, we can see that this has actually been set as the placeholder. Now, this does not mean that the value will automatically submit if no information is added. It just provides the user with context of how they should be entering their information. Within text controls, we also have the option to require input validation. In the example of this business phone, we're using a text mask to define a specific pattern so that data can only be entered in this one format. This will help ensure that you get the right information for the right field. Some controls, such as email, already have a predefined text mask. This will help ensure that when users are being asked for an email, that it's entered in a valid format. In the next group on this page, you'll notice a couple other controls that we haven't looked at yet. The first of these will be the currency control. The currency control allows users to enter monetary values, and we can in fact select which currency type we would like to be displayed to the user. In this group, we also have a date time control. The date time control allows your users to enter a specific date. You can also either require a time or hide the time, and then you can restrict whether or not the date that is entered can be in the past. The other control that we've not yet looked at is the choice control. While there are two types of choice controls in Nintex workflow forms, the single and the multiple, in this case, we're just using the single control. As you can see, choice options are entered in a comma separated value list. And then we can change our display type from either radio button or drop down. When you select drop down, you will have the option to choose please select as a display to the end user. You'll also notice that on this form, there are a couple different controls that have been grayed out. Now let's take a look at how we can interact with those controls, even though they've been disabled. If I come up here to my loan disbursement date and select the date, we'll see that values automatically get populated into those controls. Well, how did this happen? This is all being done through rules, which manage the dynamic behavior within Nintex forms. Let's go ahead and take some time to look at the rules in this form. And to start with, we'll look at the hide rule that controls when this alternative payroll covered period shows or is hidden. Here within the rules tab, we can see that we have several different rules and we're going to take a look at this set alternative payroll covered period visibility. And as you can see, rules within Nintex forms are really a combination of ifs and thens. So in this case, if the payroll schedule equals weekly or the payroll schedule equals biweekly, then our alternative payroll covered period is going to be visible. We also have an else, which will say, if that's not true, then that group will be hidden. And we can see that that is true if we go back into our preview and check out our payroll schedule selection. Weekly and biweekly show our alternative payroll cover, while the other options do not. They leave it hidden. Now, before we jump to our second page, let's also take a look at how we populated those dates. 
If we go back into our rules tab, and we're gonna take a look at this set covered period date, we can see that if the loan disbursement date is filled, so if it has any value, then our first day of covered period is actually going to have the value of that form control, so of that loan disbursement date. In this case, it's relatively straightforward, but if we jump over and take a look at our end date, we can see that we've added a little bit more logic to calculate that value. In this case, we're using the date add function. And if we look up the date add function under our functions tab here, we can see an example of how this function works and then what format the data needs to be entered in. In this example, we're taking our loan disbursement date and adding 55 days to that value to give us our end date. While this rule is calculating a single value using a function, we'll take a look at variables a little bit later and how you can start working multiple functions together to create dynamic values. Let's go ahead and jump back into our designer and then we'll take a look at the second page of this form. The second page of our form is all around these Schedule A payments that need to be made. Here is where you can see that we are really leveraging that URL variable throughout this page. As part of this particular loan process, the end user does need to fill out a worksheet and then enter the values back into this form. To make things easy for the user, we've referenced that worksheet throughout this page. And to make things easier on the designer, we've kept that URL in a form variable that can be used instead of having to type out the URL every single time. In terms of controls on this page, the majority are going to be text short controls and then currency controls as the user enters information into the sheet. We can see that there are some controls on this form that are calculating automatically using rules. And if we take a look at the rules designer again, we can see in this set schedule A line 10 and payroll costs that we are actually going to be calculating these different values and summing them all together. If we click on the insert tab here, we'll actually see that in this case, we're not doing the calculation directly in the rule, we're actually using a form variable. However, inside of this variable, we're leveraging the sum function to add together all the previous amounts that have been added to the form. If we take a moment and look at the other variables that have been built in this form, we can see that beyond just our sum value, we also can do things such as explicit math with our form calculation, or leverage functions like min to find the smallest value in a set of numbers. The other interesting part that I wanna call out on page two here is if we scroll down and we see that there is a required field. Now, if we look back at our designer, we'll actually notice that this field has not been set to required in the design canvas. So how is it possible that a field can be required in the preview, but not in the designer? Well, again, this is where you can leverage rules. And in this particular case, we have it set up so that our schedule A, line 11 through line 13, if that no FTE reduction checkbox is yes, then that field is required. And so as you can see, rules can not only set values, they can also change whether or not controls are required on your form based on other interactions done by the end user. Let's go ahead and now take a look at the third page of this form here in the designer. And as we can see, this page is really all about documents, supporting documents that need to be uploaded by the end user. To facilitate this, we're going to leverage the file upload control the file upload control allows your end users to submit information into the form. Whether this is a document, an image, or just a compressed file, these can then be referenced and accessed later by your workflow. Within the file upload control, you can manage the accepted file types, the maximum number of files that can be uploaded, as well as things like the maximum file size. While these documents are required by this loan forgiveness application process, your process may be different, so feel free to play around and update this as needed. The last page of our loan forgiveness form is really going to be around a summary of everything that has been added up to this point. One helpful feature that I do wanna call out at the top of this page is this collapsible group. 
If we take a look at this in preview, we can see that this is a summary of all of our costs eligible for forgiveness. And once the user is done reading this, they can actually click the little arrow and it will collapse out of the way. So how did we do this? Well, if we jump back into our designer, in this group control, we can actually set show header to yes, and then down under formatting options, we'll want to tick the box next to collapsible. This will allow users to hide information that has been displayed in that group. As we can see, if we go through and enter some additional numbers into our schedule A fields, and then jump back over into loan forgiveness, these numbers have been translated onto this last page and some additional calculations done based on the values that have been entered. You may also notice that a lot of these controls have been disabled. The reason for this being is that on this last page, this is displaying how much money that company is going to be forgiven, and we don't want them to be able to go and manually update those on their own. Now, to facilitate this, on any of these controls, we can go back into the designer, select them, and set read only to yes. And then finally, at the end of our form, we have added a set of information to let them know that by submitting this form, they are going to be asked to sign and validate the following information, and that they are eligible to make these certifications. And with that, we've now walked through all the different parts of our request form. Let's go ahead and start taking a look at the workflow that's going to take this data, process it, and then build our application document. Now, when we close out of the form designer, you will be presented with a variables panel. This will show you all the different variables that have been related from the start event. Each one of those controls has been translated into a variable that can be used within your workflow design. When first taking a look at this workflow, you'll notice that I've broken it into four main parts. The first part is all around preparing our variables. The reason for this section of the workflow is because while we did collect a lot of currency fields on our form, currency values are held as decimals within the workflow. And so to present them correctly inside of a document, we actually want to convert them from that decimal value to a string in that currency format. The way that we'll do this is through our format number to string action. In here, we will pass it the variable that holds our decimal amount, we will set what format we want this to be in, and then we'll configure an output variable to hold that new string value. One important thing to know is that if you do need to do some manipulation in the workflow to that decimal value, to the original value entered into the currency field, you will want to do that before converting it to a string, as you will want to be able to do those operations on numerical values instead of text values, which you will get as the output. The other steps in this section are really going to be around doing some logic to understand if there is processing that needs to be done. In this case, we have things like a run if to check and see if the advanced amount is not empty. And if that has a value, we will go ahead and then also convert that to a currency string. If it's not, we would just go ahead and skip that as there's no reason for the workflow to do work it doesn't need to do. We also will then do some mass conversions using the parallel branch to convert all of these currencies at the same time. While we could do this in serial, it's just a little bit easier to manage by doing it in parallel as it doesn't extend the length of our workflow design. When you are building your workflow, when using the same type of action in multiple different instances, we recommend actually just configuring one version of the action and then copying it as many times as you need. This way, you can simply adjust one part of your configuration instead of needing to reconfigure the entire action every single time. When making those updates, you can also reference variables inside of the workflow using a shortcut of open bracket, open bracket, and then the variable name. This is especially useful when working with large quantities of variables. You'll notice that even when working with nested groups, if you have an action inside that needs configuration, that warning message will bubble to the surface and you will see that directly from the workflow designer even when the action is collapsed. The next part of this is actually going to also be doing some data conversion. And in this case, we are converting some dates from the number format into strings. The reason for this being is that we can then actually control explicitly what format that date comes back in. 
In this case, we want it in the month, day, year format. However, there are a variety of different formats that you can choose from. With that done, we've now prepared all the variables that we need to use elsewhere in our workflow. The next part of this workflow is going to be focused on understanding if a folder already exists in our file storage system for this user, and if not, creating a new folder for them. In this particular example, we're leveraging Box as our online file storage system, and to check to see if a folder already exists, we're going to use the get folder contents action from our Box actions. In this action configuration, we're going to provide a folder path where we want this action to look. We'll then get the names of all the items in that folder, as well as the paths of the different items within that folder. Because this get folder contents action outputs a collection, we then want to use our count item in collection action to see how many items were in that folder. We've then added a run if condition that will check to see if that folder count is greater than zero, which will let us know that there were in fact items inside of that folder. And if there are items already in that folder, then we're going to loop through each of them and look for a folder with the existing loan number. This way, when we're creating our document later in the workflow, if there's already a folder that exists, we can just upload the document there instead of creating a brand new folder in our file system. Now, if we ran through that count and the folder exists comes back as no, we'll then go ahead and create a brand new folder for this customer so that we can hold their documents in it. The third part of this workflow is we're actually going to store all of those supporting documents into either the existing folder or into that new folder that we've created. This is why it's important to get those folder paths so that we can provide them into these store file actions. If you remember, these are going to be the files that were submitted on the third page of our form, and we've held each one of these variables that can then be uploaded directly into Box. Finally, we're gonna go through and actually generate our document for this loan forgiveness application. To do this, we're going to grab our template from Box. We have this stored in a separate folder. And then we're going to leverage our generate document action directly within Nintex Workflow Cloud. In here, we can open our Nintex document tagger and we will get access to all the different variables that we have within the workflow. These tags can then be inserted directly into an Office document and the workflow will populate those tags with whatever value is held inside that variable. If you'd like access to the template that we're using in this particular walkthrough, that's available within the Nintex Process Accelerator Gallery. Within the document generation action, we'll configure our template from our workflow variable, and then we'll configure our output back into a new workflow variable. Because the document generation action stores its output as a collection of files, we then need to use the get item from collection action to extract that first document into a file variable. It's important to note that collections start at an index of zero, which is why we were passing it zero as the index for this action configuration, as that represents the first item in the collection. And then our very last step is going to be using Nintex sign to get the e-signature from our applicant. Once they've signed the document, we'll then store that information back into their folder inside a box. Here inside of our get applicant signature action, you can configure who this is going to, provide a customized message, set our days until expiry, and then select where you want that document template to come from. In this case, it's going to be our document file that we created in the previous step. And as an output, we are going to grab the agreement URL that we can use in our emails a little bit later, our agreement ID, the status, and those signed files as a collection. We'll then wrap this up, grabbing those signed files using our get item from collection again, storing them back into box, and then sending a confirmation email with those signed files attached. And with that, we've now completed the walkthrough of this workflow. Please make sure to check out our other walkthrough videos, and we can't wait to see what you build next using Nintex Workflow Cloud.